Okay, uh, thanks John, thanks for the introduction. Um, the title of the talk that I was going to give was this one here, um, which really means isn't green chemistry simply good chemistry? And I think Ingrid's answered that probably more than once for us, so the answer is yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. No. Um, so what I want to do today is tell you a little bit more about sort of some of the chemistry that we do in my group. I want to sort of reaffirm um, what our, our first keynote uh, speaker was talking about yesterday, which is the, the idea of using supramolecular chemistry as a, as a concept in green chemistry as well. So first thing, uh, I guess I could just mention, you know, 12 principles of green chemistry are great. I think they've been articulated well, but sometimes I think they're probably articulated too well. People um, use them to, to validate research, but I think also to be quite critical of processes because you can you know, um, just go down the list literally rattling off until you say, you know, it's green until I get to this point. I think a lot of people don't like that, but anyway. Um, so where we were is to say, uh, what's green, uh, what's good? I think much that's green is good. Um, that's not to say, of course, that uh, there's very much bad chemistry around either. I just want to make that point as well. I think most chemists are, are really into good chemistry. Um, it's just how they make that green in the process. So for all the diversity of structures that nature has at its disposal, it primarily uses the processes of self-assembly and self-organisation to produce thermodynamically stable structures at both the cellular and subcellular levels. Now, as you can see on the side here, we have a scale. That scale relates to um, a, a nanometer. A nanometer scale on this side here, you can see chemistry, and, and this is sort of excluding polymer sciences. Sort of the best thing we can make in terms of size is paleotoxin or something similar than that. Um, right down there, of course, to the carbon-carbon bond. So there's a lot that we can learn as chemists that, uh, that build into, into uh, this area of biological systems. For many years, scientists and engineers have also used what might be termed a top-down um, top approach. Uh, uh, top-down approach to uh, making microfabricated systems at the nanometer or near nanometer level using a range of um, uh, lithography techniques that dismantle elements will raise down to that level. However, there are problems associated with heat dissipation and the cost of fabrication that make that uh, uh, way or approach um, not feasible in the long run. In 1957 or thereabouts, in 1957 or thereabouts, Thank you very much. Um, Richard Feynman, in um, one of his famous lectures uh, uh, entitled There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, suggested that what we should do uh, as scientists is perhaps use the elements that nature uses, uh, this so-called bottom-up approach, to taking smaller building blocks and building them into larger systems that might either have a structural or functional uh, aspect to them. And that's the sort of work that I want to talk to you today um, mostly about. I have two different parts to this talk. So, enter supramolecular chemistry. Um, given uh, the axes here, one is complexity, the other is breadth. We know as chemists that uh, we can just about take any atom or element and bind it to any other atom or element. We can do it in, in a myriad of different ways. But the complexity of the systems that we have related to biological systems is quite low. Biology, on the other hand, has this high level of complexity associated with it. But of course, the breadth of chemistry it uses to gain that complexity is quite low in comparison. So what supramolecular chemistry does is sort of tries to fill in this gap here trying to use the chemistry that we know, build that using a bio-inspired type of approach to make new systems uh, that function in completely different ways, or in fact uh, other systems that also mimic biological systems as well. So here's a little movie, you can watch the little movie, it's probably time to, to, to just watch something. This is a black, uh, bacterial flagellum. What you'll notice is that there are a series of components, uh, each with a different colour. Those components self-assemble, ultimately to form the apparatus. You'll notice within this apparatus that it is surface fixed. This is another phenomenon that when you start to talk material science is also quite important. You'll see it's multifunctional. There are many components that make up the system. But what the system actually does at the end of the day is lead to unidirectional motion. Okay, so it does um, machine-like work, which is something that uh, Tatsuyu was trying to um, uh, discuss with us uh, yesterday to some degree. So as you can see, this bacterial flagellum will continue to grow. I'll just speed it up a bit because I haven't got much time. 
see, and it grows 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 and ultimately ends up forming the flagella. So these are, these are important principles. This is just uh, one approach to, uh, to, to showing how self-assembly can end up making um, quite large, in fact, uh, macroscopic type of machines. Okay. So let's talk about the concept of self-assembly and I have a very simple example for you here. The example that I have relates to this macrocycle here, this, this blue macrocycle. And for many different uh, um, years we, we tried to make this macrocycle without much success. So what we decided to do was try a different approach and the approach goes something like this. If you can make a pre-organised macrocycle to clip the one that you want, unclip the one that you're using as a template, you should get exactly what you want. Okay, so that's the approach that we want to use. Here you can see quite clear this is the pre-organised macrocycle, it's just a simple crown ether made up of a sterification reaction. What we wanted to do was this glazer coupling reaction uh, where we took this uh, bisacetylene under these sorts of conditions here and to our surprise we made this 2-catenane. This 2-catenane was made in 65% yield which is quite a remarkable achievement given what uh, what, uh, when you think about what's happening in the reaction, um, this is, uh, this is uh, uh, quite a substantial yield. Interestingly, uh, a catenane, uh, catenane or comes from the, the Latin catena, meaning just chain, which means that these two molecules or these two rings are mechanically interlocked. So there's no covalent bond that links that ring to this ring here. Okay, so they're essentially topological isomers of the independent units. The other thing that's interesting is this compound here is colourless. This one here is a cream solid, so slightly uh, not colourless, but uh, a cream solid. When we mix them and we make the catenane, it's an intense purple colour. Okay, as a result of the partial charge transfer interactions that occur between the electron-rich and electron-deficient units. Okay, so we're using this template effect in order to build up the structure that we've got. Uh, these are triple bonds up here. Just wait, yeah. Uh, I'll get to a crystal structure for you, okay? <laughs> Make more sense. Okay, so supermolecular chemistry is, really means that there's a, uh, properties are different in the ensemble that you form to the components that you have. We've already seen that as a clear example. We've taken two colourless materials and made a highly coloured one. So optically, we've made something that's quite different in terms of its physical properties. Here's another example. This is, again, just to recall that the catenane is essentially these two topological isomers here, and that these two topological isomers should undergo the same type of chemistry as you get within the catenane. If we do a simple hydrolysis of this reaction, you see quite clearly that uh, to hydrolysis these two esters here, um, you get less than 15% complete after about 260 hours. Okay? Do the same thing on just the crown ether itself and it occurs really, really quickly. So again, both phys physically now and chemically, we see very different properties for, uh, for these molecules. So there is a supramolecular effect that's happening. Again, you can look at this in other ways. Here's the crystal structure for you. So here's the acetylenes across the top and across the bottom. Yes, they are bent. <laughs> yeah, um, that uh, also um, crystallizes quite nicely to form a, a porous material as well. Uh, but one of the more interesting properties from the sort of work that I do is this idea of dynamic motion. So if you can imagine having the naphthalene inside the ring or having the naphthalene outside the ring, and looking at the dynamics of that system and trying to control the dynamics of that system, you end up with states that are on and off. And that's essentially what we do with a lot of the work um, in my research group. Okay, so that's an example. Here's another example. Um, it's a very complicated slide. I don't need you to understand much of what's going on there, except that we're taking this bisporphin system and we're going to coordinate it with zincs in the middle um, to this uh, diamine, essentially. Um, all I want you to know here is that there are lots of equilibria. So supramolecular chemistry uses thermodynamics in order to produce um, the compounds that we want, the most stable structures. So while all of these ultimately happen, the system is pre-organized in a way or instructed in a way to ultimately form this little system down here. Um, there's lots of work that goes on like this. Um, again, Tatsuya um, showed a lot of this work uh, yesterday as well. Um, 
we tend to need to be inspired by, by things around us in terms of um, motivating us to do, do chemistry. And this is one of the things that really motivates us. Um, this is looking at the photosynthetic reaction centre, both the light harvesting systems as well as the special pair here. Um, don't need to go through this in any great detail except to say that these photoactive and redox active components are put together with precise distances and orientations to facilitate the transduction of solar energy in terms of light harvesting into electrical energy, ultimately leading to this chemical work that is the generation of ATP from ADP. That's essentially what photosynthesis does. Um, but there's lots of uh, interesting aspects to this. Um, Lothar yesterday spoke about green chemistry um, starting or originating back in the 1970s or thereabouts. I want to challenge that with, uh, with this statement here by uh, Chimachin back in Science in 1912. I'd like you to have a read of that because I think it's incredibly important. Um, it talks about new processes of using solar energy uh, to create uh, energy and the like. Um, um, having these um, colonies or forests of glass tubes over the plains and glass buildings, yes, which um, give rise to the guarded secrets of plants. Um, and the part that's really important for us, I think, is this bit down here. Uh, for nature is not in a hurry and mankind is. Even back in 1912, this was recognised. It's even more important today. Oh, oh, we can't stay connected. That's all right. Nice. All right, so just moving forward then a little bit, hopefully. Hello. What's happened there? Moving forward then, so a lot of the work that we do in my group, um, I'm not going to talk about much of it today, um, is around the, the concept of looking at electron transfer processes and system and building multi-porphyrin arrays. I want to show you one example though of a multi-porphyrin array that I think you might, uh, might enjoy. It goes sort of like this. If we can take uh, components and pre-organize them around a template, then what we should be able to do after a covalent modification, and hopefully it's a simple process, lead to different sorts of geometries of, in our case, macrocycles, because that's what we're interested in. So what we're trying to do here is look at macrocyclization against polymerization and try and bias against one, make a thermodynamic sink here so that we get the product that we want at the end of the day, do things under mild and reversible conditions so that that most stable structure is formed. I want to talk about this process and then maybe we can just ask ourselves what would happen if we tried the different templates as well. This is just one of the examples I want to give you. Okay, so if we start with this porphyrin over here, which has these butenol groups on the outside, and we do a, a metathesis reaction, in this case just using uh, Grubb's first generation in the presence of uh, um, C60, um, what we ultimately end up with is this trimeric structure down here, which we can take out the fullerene ultimately to give us the macrocycle itself in a 62% yield. So when you think about what's happening here, we've made six new bonds in a one prop process and made something that's very much on the nanometer scale uh, by doing so. If we don't have the fullerene in there, we only get a trace of this trimer. What we essentially get is a dimer. So we only get a trace of the trimer. So this is truly a template directed approach. I don't have a slide here, but the question you might ask is what if we change the template from C60, which is round spherical, to something that's not so round, maybe a football shape, so C70. In fact, if you use C70 as a template in this reaction, you get a different product distribution. In fact, the, the, the major product of the reaction is the tetramer, so the square rather than this trimer that you're seeing before us. Um, fluorescence is something else that we're very much into. Um, um, and again, for, for reasons that you, you probably are all, all recognise, um, there's quantifiable properties associated with it. The sensitivity of fluorescence is quite high. And we're using this as a means of, um, um, of doing a, a range of sensor types of work. One type that I want to talk to you about is this one here, which again, I'll put a, a different slant on it. If we take this uh, naphthalene dye uh, anhydride here, uh, we do the imidation reaction um, with uh, this as the side chain, this alcohol as the side chain. In toluene, what we see is an increasing 
uh, amount of fluorescence given off as a result of an eczema formation. What we thought to ourselves is, can we, can we replace that toluene or can we use the toluene in a different way in order to also get this eczema formation? And we did that by simply introducing a tosal group to the outside there. So the crystal structures of the system are quite ordered and here you see the crystal structure of the um, um, of the tosylated material. It's a highly ordered structure. In the crystalline state, there's no fluorescence from this molecule. But as you melt it, you get this intense green fluorescence. The quantum yield is about 0.6 uh, as a result of eczema formation by simply having a slippage. So by, by sort of replacing the solvent with something that's solvent-like, uh, we get these, uh, these fantastic sorts of results. And we use this in, as temperature probes. Another one is to look at the core substitution of these naphthalene demides. Again, quantum yields are incredibly high and you get variable colour within them. Cut a long story short, the example I want to show you here is one of sensing amines, primary amines. So there's a glass slide here that's been covered with this compound. On exposure to the amine, you get an incredibly bright fluorescence, in this case a deep red fluorescence, as a result of the reaction that's occurring in this case. Um, what I'd like to do, though, is, is tell you about some uh, other work that we're doing in utilising cellulose. This is, this is going to bring together some nanotechnology um, uh, using titanium dioxide. Five minutes. Yep. If I take six, don't come down and beat me. Okay. Here are the, here are the problems as we see it. So there are two problems that we're looking at here. Um, one I'll talk in depth about, the other won't. They both involve cellulose. The first is the use of uh, sago palm waste. Everyone knows about sago palm in Malaysia in particular. Um, there's a large problem with, the, with the, the, the waste associated with that. We've been taking that waste and uh, doing some chemical transformations on it um, to uh, make uh, simple hydrogels out of that material that we're using back into farming, back into farming to um, um, to use to, to, uh, as a release for, for um, um, agricultural materials, fertilisers and the like. The main story I want to talk about today is this idea of using visible life self-cleaning materials. Um, we all know, of course, that we, have, uh, we use detergents when we wash, we have energy when we use it, we have these big wastewater treatment plants, of course, um, which collect much of, of the, the waste that comes through. However, uh, some of it does get through and we have some sort of aquatic pollution that happens. Wouldn't be great if you, if you uh, had a stain on your clothes, you went out in the sun and it cleaned it by itself. That's the idea, okay. So we're going to use two different approaches to this. The first approach we're going to use is to use uh, titanium dioxide photocatalysis. And we had some introductions to this yesterday, so I won't go through that. The other aspect, of course, is using the lotus effect. So having a hydrophobic surface, uh, the roughness there, so that water can essentially capture the dirt particles and, and roll off. So we're going to combine those two in a very quick story. If we just use titanium dioxide for this, um, as was introduced yesterday, you use UV light for that. UV light is okay, a um, bit harmful, that's okay, um, but it only makes up 5% of the spectrum, of the total spectrum. Um, so there's another 95% of the spectrum that's not used. So is there some way of maybe using a disensitized approach here to, uh, to start to utilize um, this part of the, um, of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum. Enter our, uh, our compound here, uh, we're going to call it TCPP from now on, it's porphyrin. Um, we went through a, a lot of different sorts of uh, dye conditions, what makes a suitable dye. We want to have strong absorption, of course, it binds to TO2 and it does that through the carboxylic acids. Easily available, low cost of production, photochemically stable, and that's something we'll talk about as we move through the rest of this talk, um, and is tunable through functionalization and has no harm on skin. The exact process that we do here is take the pristine cotton, add a very thin layer of TiO2 as a sole onto that, and then we can link the porphyrin onto, uh, onto that system. You can see here that there isn't much change in the, in the, um, uh, the quality or the colour of the, the pristine cotton. It's a little bit darker. 
Um, this slide shows that there's a, a, an activity associated with this system. Again, as was mentioned yesterday, methylene blue tends to be the gold standard for this. So you stain the cotton with the methylene blue and you look for the, uh, um, the loss of color of the methylene blue over time. And as you can see, um, by having the porphyrin on there at varying concentrations, um, and it's, it's concentration dependent, but not in the way that you think it would be, um, in that the, um, the optimum case is this one here, which is 20 micromole. 100 micromole and 200 micromole uh, don't, are not as efficient as 20 micromole. I'm happy to discuss that later on as to why that is, that is the case. But ultimately, um, let's have a look at some swabs and see what happens. So looking at coffee on this side and a very poor Shiraz on this side, you can see quite clearly that within the pristine cotton, the TCP, uh, or with TiO2, there's not a lot that's happening, but with the uh, advent of adding the porphyrin onto the TiO2, we certainly see a reduction in the spot. Again, with the wine, you see the same thing. But there's something else that you also notice there. The other thing that you notice, of course, is that the stain associated with the, t with the TPP also disappears. So there's a photo bleaching effect that's also happening in this work. We can change that. Okay, by making metalloporphyrin variants of the system. And you can see by adding zinc, copper, iron, etc., to, uh, to the middle of the porphyrin. They don't um, bleach methylene blue as fast as the free base does, but hopefully something along these lines might also be more photostable. And in fact, the copper case is. So this is the free base that we've seen in terms of photostability. It's not great, but uh, the copper TCP is, uh, in fact, far better. Um, for this sort of work. Looking at the, at the lotus effect, what we're looking for is a super hydrophobic effect where we have these huge contact angles. These contact angles are greater than 150 degrees um, um, define what a super hydrophobic material is. And there's been many cases of this. The idea that we have, of course, is that you have the pristine cotton, you put on the, um, the TEI2, um, you then put on the porphyrin, and then we're gonna use these, uh, these uh, um, octadecal groups here as the means of, of involving the hydrophobicity to it to ultimately give us the drop. Let's have a look at some examples. So if we take pristine cotton and we add a drop of water to it, of course it just absorbs into the cotton. No problems at all. If we add the TiO2 to the system, we get the drop retaining on the surface, so we get some hydrophobicity. The problem with it is, though, it's not super hydrophobic because of the contact angle associated with it. If we add the porphyrin to the surface, again, it becomes quite um, quite soluble um, to the to the water uh, as a result of the carboxylic acid groups on the porphyrin. Um, I'm getting there. Yep. Give me two. Give me two. <laughs> um, but it's only with the case where we have the the three. Um, 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 components together that we get the super hydrophobic effect. He's going to come and beat me up now, I can see that. <laughs> um, and as you can see, uh, as you can see here in terms of the photocatalytic effect, having the TI, uh, the, the, the porphyrin, the TMS groups on there and the TiO2 give us a much better sort of uh, photocatalytic properties associated with this material. The reason it happens is, which is quite bizarre, is that methylene blue can um, exist in two forms, in either a monomeric form or a dimeric form. In the dimeric form, which is what you tend to get, um, it stabilizes it. Each of the molecules stabilizes itself. So the photocatalytic effect is much less. By having um, these large octile groups uh, or dodecal groups on there, what that does is uh, make the, uh, the mono case which means that you get photo bleaching a whole lot quicker for the methylene blue. I'm racing now, we can wash the materials and everything stays on there, so that's all good for us as well. Um, this is some conclusions, let's not worry about concluding anything because there's still a lot of work to do and we still live here. So, <laughs> so uh, I'll stop there, thanks very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Um, at this time, since we've gone over a little bit on the time and we're in the next, next session's uh, time, if you have any questions for him, at coffee break is a great time to go talk to him and ask him personal questions, okay? We're, we're not gonna do no questions because I gotta get the next person up. Thank you.